Well, greetings again, brothers and sisters and Messiah. Greetings. This is Philip Shields. I have a question for you. We've just come back from the Feast of Tabernacles from Sukkot, and a time picturing the restoration of the earth spiritually, physically, until it literally is like the Garden of Eden all around the world. That's the theme of my message today. The wonderful world tomorrow, the once pristine planet, after the seven days of creation in Genesis 1 and 2, will once again be a Garden of Eden. The living God gave us an environment that he created originally by his word. But what on earth has happened to this planet Earth? What will happen before the return of Messiah? How will we leave? How will we... He gave us a planet when he created Adam and Eve. How are we going to return that planet and its ecology and environment to its creator? Not, not too long from now. What roles and responsibilities do you and I have with God's creation? I have to say, I haven't heard a lot of sermons. I've never actually heard a whole sermon on this before. I'm sure there are thousands that have been preached. I haven't heard any, but I'm sure there are, there are those. It's just I'm not aware of them. I know I haven't talked about it, and I haven't heard about it in the Church of God groups that I've been attending or the Messianic groups. I, at least the ones I've heard, I've talked about it here and there within a sermon, but never an entire sermon. And so I'm sure it's time to talk about it. Why do we have to talk about it? Why don't we just talk about prophecy or something else or, or uh, understanding some concept of Scripture? Because this is a concept of Scripture. Because what is most important in our lives is our relationship with our Savior and our Father in heaven. The Apostle Paul liked to say that everything else was dung or garbage compared to this one thing, that I may know him, that I may know him. Our Savior, Yeshua, actually defines eternal life in John 17, the first few verses, as when we come to know the one true God, his Father and God in heaven, and the one the Father sent, Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. You can read it. I think it's going to take an eternity. It's going to take forever to be able to fully say that you have come to know the Father and Yeshua. And that's perhaps one reason why it's part of the definition of eternity. Eternal life. Read it. Everything we do spiritually, everything spiritual we read or study or listen to, should be helping us in that relationship with Yeshua uh, when I say Yeshua, that's the Hebrew name for Jesus. I'll say Jesus as well, but I'm sure he never heard that sound, that word. He was called, his mama called him Yeshua. And our, anyway, uh, everything we do should be helping our relationship with Yeshua and his father and our father in heaven. Everything. If it doesn't, then it may fall into the category of it's simply knowledge that's puffing up. Knowledge puffs up, the Apostle Paul said or Rabbi Shaul, as some call him. Have you thought of it that way? Every sermon I preach on this website is designed to bring us to a closer walk with our Creator and Savior. <clears throat> That's the intent, at least. So please understand, if something isn't bringing you to know Abba and Yeshua better, more intimately, then what's the point of it? Now I'd like to point out, in this topic of of uh, creation and our uh, stewardship of it and our responsibilities with it. In Romans 1, verse 20, Romans 1, verse 20, it says, From the creation of the world, his, his, God's invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood through what he has made. He's saying we can understand God better if we will open our eyes and see and understand him through the things he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. Now, we can actually learn about the true God by learning more and more and appreciating more about his creation. We can see God in the creation, according to Paul. That's one reason I love nature shows so much. 
That's one reason I like to go in the woods behind our house and commune with my eternal God. Even as a child, I remember hearing my mom and dad speak of, Isn't God great? Look at the humor God has. You can tell he has humor just by watching the monkeys, they would say, or this or that, and they would chuckle and, and, and marvel at the humor of God. Other times it would be about the creativity, the artistic ability that he had as we would view a beautiful sunset in the Philippines together. Or they'd talk about how God, uh, the eternal God, feeds the birds and take care of, takes care of the wild flowers. And if he does that for them, I feel surely watch over you, Philip. I grew up with that. We can learn so much from creation. As I watch my father take a, a dead hill and make it into a beautiful oasis of fruit trees and gardens and, and uh, roads with, with uh, uh, rock terraces all along them and, and fish ponds and made it a beautiful, beautiful sight in the Philippines over many years and hard work. He turned it into a Garden of Eden there. So with that in mind, let's understand how this planet and all we see and interact with on this planet is from the, the Creator. It is His. It belongs to Him. He's given us this planet and our lives, frankly, is a precious gift that's very special to Him. If He gives you a gift of Steuben, or if anybody gave you, if I gave you a gift of Steuben crystal, very expensive, fine crystal, that was special to me, expensive, made specially for you. And it came from my heart to you because you see the planet, as you'll see soon as we read the scriptures, was God's gift to us. It was our inhabitant, our, our habitation where, we, where God intended us to, to, to live and be taken care of and raise our children. And, and so if I gave you this gift of fine Steuben crystal, and it meant something to me, and it was very special. And I see you now, I come back and find out that you've been using this piece of fine Steuben crystal as a urinal. How will that affect our relationship? I suggest we've done that very thing with the wondrous gift Yahweh has given us of his once pristine creation. By the time we're done today, I hope you'll see everything around you in different light and see the hand of Creator in all of creation. I don't like to use the word nature. Nature implies it just sort of happened. I like to say creation. In turn, I hope this message will help you appreciate our living God, His Son, more than ever before, ever, ever before. I hope that will help. I pray it will help you walk with God more closely and have a deeper relationship. Anyway, um, this is just one of thousands of topics, of course, that help us walk with God, but it is an important one. Now let's get the balance on environment and using the earth properly. Let me say right off the get-go, we're going to be talking about the environment, our stewardship of it today. But I'm not a wacko environmentalist. There are balanced environmentalists, and there are wacko environmentalists. There are dangerous and, ex and crazy extremists out there who worship what they refer to as Mother Earth, and they'll go to any length to stop any tree from being cut down or to stop any animal from being slaughtered for dinner. They'll put long spikes into trees marked for cutting so when the logs go through the sawmills, the Sawyer's lives are put at risk. There are nut jobs who will burn SUVs and car lots to protest gas-guzzling vehicles. I say that's despicable. I am not a tree hugger. I am not one espousing the largely discredited politics of global warming, so-called. I know some people, including a former vice president, who are making millions from their rants about global warming. So I'm not there, folks. But does that mean we disregard everything about the environment? No way. Now, there's a group called the Voluntary Human Extinction Movement. I'm not making this up. The Voluntary Human Extinction Movement. They want to voluntary, voluntarily quit having babies to give the earth a chance to recover as man finally becomes extinct because they believe the earth would be better off without humans, they say. There's another wacko group. I call them wacko groups called Earth First, 
They teach every species is equally valuable and important, including no, we're no more important than a slug, according to them, as I understand it, unless I'm wrong. We've all heard of Greenpeace, another French group started in 1970. Members chain themselves to coal power plants or block and harass Japanese whaling ships. I sympathize with illegal whaling. I mean, I sympathize with, with, a, being, uh, uh, with hating illegal whaling, but that's not the way to do it. Then there's the Earth Liberation Front, the Animal Liberation Front, the Animal Rights Militia, and on and on and on. Some of these last ones I just mentioned have even been listed on list as dangerous terrorist movements by the FBI. Some of the groups even carry out acts of arson and bombings. Have you heard of eco-terrorism? That's not what the sermon is about today. On the other hand, neither do I support the wanton destruction of our planet by so many corporations driven by corporate greed. So I'm hoping I'm giving a balance on this. Corporations that are uh, more intent on making money than they are protecting our planet and its atmosphere and its lands. The vast jungles of the Amazon, as well as parts of the South Asian area, are the lungs of the planet, and they are being bulldozed, cut down, burned at an alarming rate. I have no desire to associate with that other side either. My heart sighs and cries when I see a mountainside here in the beautiful northwest of America after mountainside after mountainside being clear-cut. Sometimes not a single tree left on the slopes. And what are we doing? Uh, the dangers for slides, landslides, the erosion down to the uh, rivers, how that will impact the salmon runs. It, it, it's, just, it, it's just horrific in my mind. Most of those logs are being shipped to the Far East, to Japan, J China, Korea, other places, Japan especially. Our oceans are being polluted by careless accidents from oil mogul, moguls, moguls. The, uh, the BP oil spill is just the latest of many around the world. Uh, Exxon Valdez, and there are many, many others in the Middle East and Asia that go unreported over here. The vast seas are being fished out by super-efficient fishing vessels, accompanied by refrigerator motherships. Some are saying at the rate we're fishing out the oceans and depleting the stocks of fish, there eventually won't be enough fish to feed the world. Pollution and waste, all in the name of making a dollar, is pretty much global. I can't condemn all of that strongly enough either. So neither am I, a, I'm not an environmental wacko, and neither is my heart with the corporate greedy so-and-sos who are destroying our planet. So I'm not comfortable with all the efforts now to produce genetically modified or genetically engineered meat, corn, wheat, Someday, even genetically modified salmon is the next thing on, on the horizon. And everything we'll eat will have been genetically tampered with. <clears throat> it's already happening. I don't think enough testing's been done to know the consequences down the road. But what impact will it have on our bodies, on our lives, on the planet eventually? Nor do I subscribe to the thinking that mankind is unequal to turtles, monkeys, or whales or that they are our equal and that we must share the resources of this planet equally with baboons, bison, and bears. Some say they are our equal, and it's arrogant of humans to assume a superior role to any animal. I'm not there, okay? Yes, I do eat meat, which means an animal had to die. In the past, I've hunted deer and game birds, though it's been a few years since I've done that. I wish I could do more again. I love God's creation. But I know it's okay with God for me to hunt and eat meat and harvest trees from a forest. I live in a house, and so do you probably, that has considerable wood in it, which means trees had to be cut down for my house and yours. I drive a car, although less and less, as I've learned to do my job mostly by phone. But when I drive my car, that means someone had to drill down and get some oil, turn it into gasoline. But I do work out of my home more and more. Now, because I eat meat, does that mean I support the way chickens and turkeys, for example, are raised in mega hatcheries and farms just so I can have eggs and chicken? I think not. 
I think the way that some of the mega chicken farms handle their chickens is, is abominable. If I have time later, I might talk about that more. I buy my eggs from a free-range chicken farm. Not far, not, the chickens run free-range. They just see, you see them out there in the yard by the dozens, not far from our home. I don't like to support any cruel methods often seen in the large chicken farms when, when I can help it. <clears throat> so environmentalists don't think that just because someone eats meat like me or cuts down a tree that we have no respect for the creation of God. Let's get that balance, though. So I'm not there with either extreme, okay? I will preach today, however, from God's own lips, from his sacred word, that we have a solemn responsibility to do our part to protect and preserve the environment Yahweh, the great eternal God, created. There is a balance. I suspect by the time you hear this, you'll be amazed at how much is said about this in Scripture. Now, <clears throat> please, there are many in God's church who dismiss every concept associated with environmentalism. That's not right either. <clears throat> there are others who say, excuse me, <clears throat> there are others who say, I'm just one person. I just have a third of an acre or a small backyard. What can I do? Nothing can change till Messiah comes. I hope you'll listen to this message and even tell others about it, because there's a lot you can do. I'm reminded of the story of Moses when God said to Moses in Exodus 3 and 4, and the, the part I'm talking about here is in Exodus 4, where uh, God says, I, I, listen, I've heard my, my children crying over there in Egypt, my people, and I'm, I'm going to send you to Egypt to uh, bring the people out of captivity. Well, folks, Egypt just happened to be the greatest power on earth at the time. Human power on earth, anyway. And here was a shepherd out in nowhere being told by a voice in a burning bush that he was to go and tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go. And so he said, what can I do about it? You can read this in the first four or five verses in Exodus chapter 4. God basically tells Moses something that should be a real wake-up call to all of us, that when Yahweh calls us to do something, he will provide the means. But he starts with what we have or what he's already given us. And he asks Moses the question, what is in your hand? Moses looks at it and says, a stick, a rod. Well, with this rod, Yahweh basically says, I'm going to use that rod my power will empower you and that rod to do miracles, to turn it into a snake at times, to uh, part a Red Sea someday, and on and on and on. And those things happened. I just imagine Moses probably didn't sleep with the rod next to him sometimes. Uh, <laughs> Zipporah, could you uh, put that snake outside, I mean the rod outside? <laughs> you know. Anyway, I'm just kidding, but... But I hope you'll listen to the message with that in mind, that God has given us a beautiful environment. And what little bit we have, we start to walk in faith and, and we will have, you know, uh, there's so much in the Bible that, that when God's people don't stand in the breach, that's when God finally has to destroy what there is that's left. Had there been ten people willing to stand in the breach in Sodom and Gomorrah, that city would, those cities would not have been destroyed. But there weren't ten people standing in the breach. We have to be standing in the breach now on this matter of environment and many, so many other topics. So by the time Messiah lands on the Mount of Olives, the beautiful earth God renewed in Genesis 1 will look very different. The soil and the air will largely be toxic from multiple nuclear wars, volcanic eruptions, and so on. There will be so many earthquakes, the like of which the world's never seen. So powerful that mountains will be leveled. These worldwide earthquakes will cause tsunamis, the height of skyscrapers. No wonder it says every island and every mountain will disappear. Are we hearing this? This planet will be very, very different, even toxic, by the time the King of Kings lands on the Mount of Olives with his bride. 
So here's my question, brothers and sisters. What are you prepared to do about it? What is your responsibility to the earth, the Almighty God created as a dwelling place? What example are we setting? Are we living the right example in what little bit, the little stick we have in our hand, so to speak? What example are we setting? How are we living? Do we have any responsibility to the environment? You might be surprised at how much Scripture says about that. So let's start with the beginning for some real quick review first and set the foundation. Interestingly enough, by the way, in the Jewish community, they've just begun reading the Torah all over again right after the uh, uh, last day after the feast, the eighth day. And um, on Sabbath of October 9, uh, this is just after that Sabbath, they are reading all about the flood. I thought that's interesting. They're starting again from Genesis 1, reading through. And it's interesting because the eighth day after the feast uh, pictures the new beginnings. It pictures what God's going to do to the earth in Revelation 21, 22. So now we're back from the feast. Eighth day is over. And uh, it's picturing the time God's going to make the whole earth look like the Garden of Eden again. I think it is appropriate that we go back and review all of those things. If you want to see what the earth is going to be like, I, I, I can't take the time to read it now. There's just too much to say today. I can give two or three sermons on this, believe me. There's that much. And I hope that this will get you really thinking about the topic. Go back and read Revelation chapter 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, all the way to chapter 15, and you'll see what it says the earth is going to be like. There's going to be a, a plagues and trumpet blasts and seals and everything that's going to result in one-third of the trees and grass being burnt up, one-third of the human population destroyed by large armies. A third of the what's left of humanity by that time, probably when it's all said and done, more than a third is going to be killed total. And we're also told of great tribulation on God's children. We read of hits by meteorites or even asteroids. What else could be the great mountain burning, falling into the sea that you can read about in Revelation 6 and 8 and other places? Great earthquakes plus the, me the meteorite hits make giant tsunamis never seen before, resulting in every mountain and every island moved out of its place. <clears throat> That's Revelation 6, verse 14. And then in Revelation 8 and 9, read it for yourself, there are horrific hits on the ecology and the environment. One-third of all the fish, the trees, the grass die off. A third of mankind killed in war. Revelation 9, verses 13 to 21. Revelation 9, verses 13 to 21. I'm not going to read those now. And many of these verses you might have heard during the Feast of Trumpets or Yom Teruah. This planet ends up very, very toxic. Is it possible that there's even a nuclear winter being envisioned here? I don't know. About the dark, dark days, a third of the sun, a third of the moon doesn't give its light. Finally, the two witnesses are killed in Revelation 11. Resurrected three days later. And then we read this in Revelation 11, verses 15 to 19. You might want to turn there with me on this one. Revelation 11, verses 15 to 19. The seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. And then the 24 elders, great angelic beings seated before the throne of God on their fell before God, fell on their faces, and worshipped God, saying, We thank you, Lord God, the Almighty, who is and was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry, but your wrath has come. I'm reading Revelation 11:18 now. The time has come for the dead, the nations, to be judged, and to give the reward to your servants, the prophets, like it says in Daniel 7, to the saints and to those who fear your name, give a sermon sometime about what is his name. We have to fear him and his name, both small and great. And the time has come. Now listen carefully. Revelation 11, the end of verse 18. Time has come to destroy those who destroy the earth. How does God think about it all? How, what does God think about the burning of, a, of the, uh, of the uh, jungles? What does God think of the oil spills? What does God think of raping this planet, he is going to destroy those 
who destroy the earth. Then it says God's sanctuary in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant appeared in the, in the sanctuary. There were lightnings, rumblings, thun thunders, an earthquake, and severe hail. Why is God so upset here? Destroy those who destroy the earth? Because God says he made and he owns this planet and everything in it. This is the, the beginning of the time of God's wrath. This is God's earth. He made it. He owns it. And he takes very seriously when anyone disrespects him by mistreating what he has made and gifted to us for stewardship. He's given us something to be stewards of is what I mean to say. He's royally ticked off at this point. Plus, I suspect there's something of him in everything created. The things that are seen were created by the things not seen. His Holy Spirit, no doubt, when the Spirit hovered over the waters, the Holy Spirit was involved in all of this. The Word spoke and they came to be. The Holy Spirit does it. So these are scriptures we'll read again, which state all creation is groaning and crying for their Creator to please come to their aid to save them. All creation is groaning, it says in Romans 8, verses 22 and 23. You can see why. But back to that point of Elohim, the living God creating all things, and why he's so ticked off. Turn now with me to Colossians 1, verses 15 to 18. Colossians 1, verses 15 to 18. He is the image of the invisible God, talking about Jesus Christ or Yeshua the Messiah. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. Everything, all things were created through him and for him. I want you to let that sink in. Through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Now let's get this right. All things weren't just made by him, but for him. If you had made something beautiful and perfect and gave it to someone to watch over, to use as a gift, but more of as a stewardship, to someone to use temporarily, how would you feel, how would I feel, if they treated our perfect work with contempt and destroyed it? I'm speaking not just of society, but things you and I can be doing that are destructive and not creative as well. This is a message I hope you can take something from and start to use today. Let's make it real clear about how he owns the world. Psalm 24, verses 1 and 2. I hope, you'll, I hope you're turning to these with me if you can, unless you're driving or something, unless you listen to it. By the way, we're gonna, I, I think you can already get these as a podcast if you'd like to do that. I'll, I'll talk to our webmaster about that. And you should be able to download these and put them right on your iPhone or, or whatever you have, and, um, or your Droid or whatever you have. And play them as uh, you know, as you drive around or whatever, or, or uh, even in, in you know in your in your home. Although I'm hoping more and more of you will actually use these even for Sabbath services, um, when you want to stay home and or need to stay home, and you need, you want something that's scripture based. I hope you'll find these very helpful. Psalm 24 verses 1 and 2. The earth and everything in it, the world and its inhabitants. Belong to Yahweh, belong to the Lord. For he laid its foundation on the seas and established it on the rivers. Now, speaking about the land rest and selling land and the Jubilee, the return of the land that was sold, that's in Leviticus 25. Turn there with me. Leviticus 25. Very interesting point here is made in Leviticus 25, verse 23. The land. Leviticus 25:23, the land is not to be permanently sold because it is mine and you are only foreigners 
and temporary residence on my land. Have you noticed that verse before? He didn't say just don't per- permanently sell it so it can come back to your family because it belongs to your family, as I would have thought before. He says, no, it needs to come back because it belongs to me. And you're only temporary foreigner, foreigners and temporary residents in my, on my land. Leviticus 25, 20, uh, 23. That, that passage really spoke to me. Very powerful passage, I think. So when was the last time you heard that read in church? We've been given this, uh, this planet, this earth, this country, but don't forget your one-third acre is not yours, but God's, and how you're, how you're taking care of his land. <clears throat> Remember, we're held accountable for everything we've been given. In Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 7, how about this one? Have you had this one read in church lately? Jeremiah 2, verse 7. Here's what the Creator says through Jeremiah. Jeremiah 2, verse 7. I brought you to a fertile land to eat its fruit and bounty, but after you entered, you defiled my land, my land. You defiled my land, and you made my inheritance detestable. How can it get any stronger than that? So, do you remember? God says he will destroy those who will destroy the earth. That's in Revelation 11, 18. He says humankind has destroyed and defiled his creation. So, he says, you made my inheritance detestable. Now, one of my overarching principles will be this. Don't mess with anything that isn't yours or which belongs to someone else, someone with a capital S, Yahweh, the eternal creator creator God is who I'm talking about. Don't mess with something that was made by someone else for someone else, especially when we find out that all things were created through him and for him. Wouldn't that tick you off if you made something beautifully, perfectly, and then you watch people ruin it and not appreciate it? Another overarching principle will be this. God's children seek the will of the Father, just like Yeshua did. We learn to do things not according to our will or what we desire, but according to what he wants. Our thoughts are not to be our thoughts, so we ask him, well, how do you want us to treat your third of an acre you gave us? I'm saying if we're his children, we'll talk and act and walk like Father, including, or let's put it another way, we talk and act and walk like whoever our Father is. You see, you can watch what someone does and see what he really believes. That's the real test. And I speak and I preach to myself as well. So there has to be a restoration because we've ruined it. What will have to be restored? Acts 3, verse 20 and 21 says everything will have to be restored. Everything. Acts 3, verses 20, 21 and that he may send Jesus, who has been appointed Messiah, who has been appointed Christ for you. Heaven must welcome him, Yeshua, until the times of restoration, until the times of the restoration of all things, until the times when everything is going to be restored. What does everything mean? It means everything. It means everything. What's going to be restored? That's a whole separate sermon. I'll give one on that sometime. But for now, let's just focus on the fact that the planet will certainly have to be restored. The air will have to be restored. It's toxic. The water will have to be restored. The land will be toxic. And, of course, there are many, many other things that will have to be restored. A pure language, the land of Israel, uh, the, 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 the unity between Judah and Ephraim, um, the Holy Spirit on the earth covering the earth. God's way, God's Torah, God's law will be taught from Mount Zion. It says in Isaiah 2 and Micah 4. And um, everything will have to be restored. Marriages, families, everything. And this planet will have to be restored. That's worthy of a whole sermon by itself. You've been called to be a forerunner in understanding what our role on this earth is and what we can and should be doing about it. Turn now to Genesis 1. 
Genesis 1, verses 26 to 28. I'm going to read this out of the uh, CJB version. When Elohim, the living God, created Adam and Hava, or Eve, he gave them, the Hebrew name is Hava, he gave them more than just one command. I've heard it preached recently that they had only one command. Don't eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But that's not true. God, God gave several. That's the only do not do kind of command. But at the end of Genesis 1, there are several do commands, several positive commands. Let's turn and read them. Genesis 1, 26 to 28. This passage is often used to justify exploiting the planet, so we need to address it. And then Elohim said, God said, let us make humankind in our image, <clears throat> in the likeness of ourselves. And let, after our likeness, as it says in King James, in our image and after our likeness, after the likeness of ourselves. Did he make fish in his likeness? Did he make baboons in his image? Did he make whales in his image or after his likeness? No, it's not said that about any other creature. Elohim said, let's make mankind, humankind, after our image. And, he, and let them rule over the fish, let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds in the air, the animals, and over all the earth. Let them rule over all the earth. Have dominion over it, you see. And over every crawling creature that crawls on the earth. So Elohim created humankind in his own image, and in the image of God he created him. Male and female were both created in the image of God and in his likeness. Male and female both. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, be fruitful, uh, multiply, fill the earth. So the, the, the voluntary extinction people read this here. God said, Be fruitful, full, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and rule over every living creature that crawls on the earth. And then at the end of the chapter... At the end of the sixth day, after the creation of woman and every physical thing was finished, God looked at what he had done and pronounced it very good. At the end of all the other days, he just pronounced them good. So it's pretty clear Elohim is putting mankind in charge of the earth. It's pretty clear that only mankind was made in God's image after God's likeness. I say this because there are many who feel that every creature on earth is equal to man the man has no higher right than, or higher position than any other animal. Scripture says otherwise, brethren. We might all be mammals technically, scientifically, but only mankind was made in the image of God. Only mankind has the spirit of man in him that makes him able to, to uh, uh, tune in to God, makes him able to, able to have reason the way we do. And only mankind was put in charge of the whole earth. <coughs> Turn now to Mark 10. But our rulership of the earth was to be Christ-like, Messiah-like. It was to be servant leadership. It was not to be a rapacious kind of le leadership. A rulership of love and service and kindness. Not rampant pillaging of the earth and its animals. That principle is taught in Mark 10, verses 42 to 45, when there was an argument between the disciples as to who would be the greatest and who would sit on the left and the right of, of the king of kings. And he called them together to himself in Mark 10, verse 42, and he, I'm going to paraphrase it here, 42 to 45, where he says, look, the rulers of the Gentiles dominate those they rule, and their men of high positions exercise power, lordship over them. But it shall not be so among you. On the contrary, you want to be great, then become a great servant. And you want to be first, be first slave of all. Just as the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. Knock it off, he says. Yes, I put you in charge of the earth. It doesn't mean you can clear cut and pillage and rape and ruin it. it doesn't mean that at all. Mark 10 was to be our model. Mark 10 was to be our model. Messiah-like domination of the earth leads to serving the needs of the planet and its inhabitants wisely, kindly, restoratively. What does it mean to fill the earth, subdue it, rule it, dominate it? 
that phrase has been used to defend and even attack particular views about the environment. Some say it means we can do whatever we want. That is not true, based on all the other scriptures I've been reading. The Hebrew words for subdue and have dominion or rule are very, very strong words. Taken by themselves, yes, they're very strong. Um, it, it can mean to bring into subjection, bring into bondage. Yes, it can. Dominion can can mean to subjugate, to crumble off. It can mean to reign, rule over. But when we look at all the scriptures on it, there's a little more to be said about this. A little more to be said about it. Turn now to Psalm 37, verses 29 to 31. The righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it permanently. The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom and speak, speaks what's just. Now Psalm 37, 31 the instruction of his God is in his heart. <coughs> his steps do not falter. <coughs> what are God's instructions? Rule the earth, but rule it like I do. Keep it and tend it. Let's turn now to Genesis 2. So God gave man a job. The oldest profession. It is abominable that it's commonly understood that the oldest profession is, is prostitution. That is abominable because that is not scriptural and it is so wrong. Mankind is told to dominate and subdue the earth and, uh, and the animals. So, so what happens next? Eve has not been created yet. Elohim gives Adam a job. He creates them outside the garden. And now he brings them into the Garden of Delights, the Garden of Eden, that means delights. And let's read it in Genesis 2, verses 7 to 9. Then the eternal God, the eternal Elohim, formed the man out of the dust from the ground and breathed the breath of life into his nostrils, and the man became a living being. Living soul, I think it might say in the King James, but it means a living being, as I'm reading in this translation, the Apologetics Version. And then the eternal God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he placed the man he had formed. So. Man had to be invited into God's presence. The Garden of Eden, the Garden of Delights, was a type of the kingdom of God, was a type of the Holy of Holies on earth. And so the Lord God caused to grow out of the ground every tree pleasing in appearance and good for food, including the tree of life in the midst of the garden, as well as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But what I'm pointing, what I'm, and then we come to verse 15. He places the man in the garden. We come now to verse 15. And the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. When, when the Eternal gives you land, he wants us to tend and keep it. What's a keep? A keep is where you put sheep in to protect them, to guard them. And so... That's why in the CJB version it says God took the person and put him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and care for it. The Apologetics version in verse 15 says he placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to watch over, guard it, keep it. That's what keep means. A keep is a protective place. So when we keep the Sabbath, we guard the Sabbath. We guard that holy time from other things that can disrupt it, from being holy consecrate it. Right off the bat, the first thing Yahweh Elohim, the eternal God, says is, okay, this is a good earth I'm giving you and a gorgeous garden called the Garden of Delights. Now care for it, guard it, tend it, keep it nice. Keep it a Garden of Delights. When Elohim gives us any, anything, he ex Elohim is the Hebrew word that's translated God, mostly in Genesis 1 and 2. He expects us to value it by caring for it. I taught my children when I bought them bikes. They don't just they run up to the house with their bikes, pedal up to the house, and then just drop it on the ground. No, they, I wanted to put the kickstand down and show me that they valued the hard work that I put into coming up with the money to buy them a new bike. I taught my children to feed their dog, bathe it, keep it clean, give it clean water to drink. With the pet comes responsibilities. They have to clean up the yard as well. They have to exercise the dog from time to time. Our Father in heaven is no different. 
And he says, I've made a beautiful garden for you to live in. And I expect you to keep it pretty and keep it at least as good as I gave it to you. And I think we should try to even improve. Um, you, know, you leave something cleaner and better if we go camping or something. But that should speak volumes to us about what our Creator wants from us. The men and women who say this earth is beginning for our use and we can do whatever we want, you aren't reading God's mind. Libya and the Sudan in North Africa was once the bread basket of the Roman Empire. That's where all the wheat came from for the Roman Empire. They had vast areas of fertile land. They had rivers and streams and crocodiles and marshes as well. Today it's a barren desert. Turn out of Romans 8. And that's going to happen to this country if we don't watch it. Romans 8, verses 20 to 23. I alluded to this earlier. As children of God, do we have a responsibility to the earth that Elohim has created? We're told the whole of creation is groaning. Romans 8, verses 20 to 23. For the creation was subjected to futility. Romans 8, 20. Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with their birth pangs together until now. The whole creation groans, brethren, waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Humankind as a rule has not been very good to the ecology. Look what we did to millions of bison, almost wiped them out. We've even wiped out whole populations of birds just to get the feathers for women's hats a century ago. Now we're scrubbing the seafloors of any sellable sea life. International treaties are not strong enough to keep that from happening unless eternal steps in. The creation, where we, I'll read it later, will sing for joy at his return. Now turn to Luke 16. Luke 16, verses 10 to 12. The principle there is that we will be judged by what we've been given. Whoever is faithful, Luke 16, verses 10 to 12. Whoever is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. And whoever is unrighteous in very little is unrighteous in much. And so if you've been faithful with the unrighteous money, if you've not been faithful with unrighteous money, who will trust you with what is genuine? If you have not been faithful with what belongs to someone else... I've already read that this planet belongs to God. Who will give you what is your own? If you can't take care of something that belongs to someone else, why would I give you something to, to have as your own? You're going to be judged, you and I, on what we've been given. Are we getting it? The land you've bought and owned is not yours. Take care of it. You may not think you've been given much, but remember what I said about Moses and the stick. Exodus 4, verses 1 to 5. What's in your hand, Moses? Surely more than a stick. Dedicate what you have, what talents Yah has given you, to the Almighty. Dedicate it to the Almighty. Stand back and see the wonders of God being done through your hands when you stand back in faith and watch Him work in you and open doors. How are you taking care of your backyard? How do you care for the parks and national parks you hike in and camp in? How does it look after you leave? Even when you're renting a home, and renting have a backyard and a front yard, uh, when we rented a house, we tried to make it better than we got it. We planted flowers and gardens and, and put in bushes if need be. We painted the house. We took care of things. When, when we used the toilet and we're camping in pristine areas, do you do, do, it, do you do it just anywhere? Here's an example of, you might think, are you kidding? He's talking about toilets now? Yeah, the scripture does. And so if scripture does, I will too. Here's an example of the many teachings. That's what Torah means, by the way, translated law into English. But it really means teachings in the Hebrew. Uh, it's a way, it's a way of life. If you turn with me to Deuteronomy 23... Verses 12 to 14. Here's the eternal God saying that if you don't do this toileting stuff right, it's going to affect sanitation, water purity, flies in the camp, diseases, all kinds of things. 
There's all kinds of teachings like this in the Word of God. Here's one of them, Deuteronomy 23, verses 12 to 14. It has everything to do with the environment. He says, Deuteronomy 23, 12, you must have a place outside the camp and go there to relieve yourself. You must have a digging tool, a spade of some kind in your equipment. When you relieve yourself, I want you to dig a hole with it and cover up your excrement. This is in the Bible. For Yahweh, the Lord your God, Yahweh your God, walks throughout the, your camp to protect you and deliver your enemies to you, so your encampments must be holy. He must not see anything improper among you, or he will turn away from you. It's kind of like the way I feel if our son, or, or if I or my son hasn't cleaned up the yard uh, for a while, and the, the dog mess, you know, in the yard, and I start doing yard work, I don't want to step in that stuff. Especially at night if I'm walking around. <clears throat> so that needs to be buried, picked up, and th buried someplace. <clears throat> that has everything to do with water purity and everything else. <clears throat> Sanitation. There's a verse in Ezekiel 24, verses 6 to 8, that says even blood was to be covered with earth and not just spilled over bare rock. It's just a sampling of the many, many, many teachings in the Bible that have to do with environment. Now, other laws and principles. God protected, I want you to think about this, in Noah's flood, God's flood that Noah was spared in, wasn't Noah's flood, but you know what I mean. <clears throat> God protected wildlife from extinction. Let that sink in. <clears throat> And I want to talk about that. And also, can we eat animals for food? Excuse me just a second. Um, but, but we need to understand this, brethren. We really do. In Genesis 6, verses 19 to 21, we have the story there where we have God telling Moses to make sure you bring in all these animals, two of every kind of living creature, male and female, two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, and, uh, and then, you know, Genesis 7, verses 8 to 10, he talks about the clean animals. There were more of those. But what does all this tell us? We, too, will be careful to help protect species. We would have been against the slaughter of millions of bison to the edge of extinction. But neither are we naive. There are forces out there that don't want any fish to ever be caught, any deer ever to be hunted. And uh, we're not naive about that, are we? So, but God did give us some clean animals to eat for food. Jesus ate meat, told the disciples to prepare the Passover. Abraham offered Yahweh veal for dinner, with milk, by the way, at the same time. Genesis 18, you can read that, verses 6 to 8. Isaac enjoyed the venison of Esau that he would hunt. And in Leviticus 11, God talks about the clean and unclean animals. So it certainly is okay to eat meat. It's okay not to eat meat. But it is okay to eat meat that God said could be eaten. Genesis 11, Deuteronomy 14 tells us which animals and fish, birds could be eaten. Now how about this next point? After the flood, in fact, let's turn there in Genesis 9. I'd like you to read this with me. Genesis 9, verses 8 and 9. Genesis 9, verses 8 and 9, the flood's over. Now watch the wording here. Watch how Yahweh wants to treat his animals. Genesis 9, verses 8 to 9. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and your descendants after you. And with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock. I'm reading scripture here. The birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on the earth, I'm going to establish my covenant with you and with all of them. Verse 12 and 13 again. This is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you. A covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds. I used to think the rainbow in the clouds was just a, a covenant God was making with mankind with the, that he wasn't ever going to destroy the whole planet again by flood. That's not so. You go back to Genesis 9 
And you'll read twice where he says this covenant is not just with you folks, you humankind folks. This is mankind. This is also with every living animal that's coming out of that ark. Doesn't that tell us something? When the Eternal made a covenant with animals that included animals? I hadn't seen that before. Or at least it hadn't been impressed on me before. Now let's look at another principle, the seventh year land rest. Do you ever think of Shabbat, the Sabbath, as an environmental law? Let's start with that first, the Sabbath. In every way, or in a way, even the weekly Sabbath is an environmental law. Because every week, on the seventh day, the land is at rest. Think of it. Animals won't be hunted on at least that one day, even during hunting season. Farm animals get to rest just as much as you and your family do. In fact, the fourth commandment, I'll read it this time from Deuteronomy 5, verse 14, and it, where it says, you shall, you know, six days you shall do all your labor, and you shall stop and do no work on the Sabbath, neither you nor your, nor your children. It goes on to say, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle. Everybody, everything, is, I want them all to rest. Farm animals got to rest, just as much as you and your family did. There's not a single command anywhere from Genesis to Revelation where God reverses or cancels it, by the way, and moves it to the day of the sun. No way. Now, besides the seventh-day Sabbath that gave the animals rest, there was also the land Sabbath. Every seventh year, we're supposed to let the land rest. Planting endless cycles of corn, for example, is very, very hard on the soil. So when we disobey these laws, we ruin the land like Libya and Sudan did. In Exodus 23, verses 10 to 11, Exodus 23, verses 10 to 11, Sow your land for six years and gather its produce, but during the seventh year you are to let it rest and leave it uncultivated, so that the poor among your people may eat from it, and the wild animals may consume what they leave. Do the same with your vineyard and your olive grove. Every seven years let the land rest and what grows up naturally and of its, of its own volition. Uh, the poor can just harvest it. They can keep it. They can eat from it. And I want it for the animals. Isn't that amazing? It goes on in Leviticus 25, verses 1 to 7, the same thing. When you enter the land I'm giving you, the land which you'll observe is Sabbath to the Lord. You may sow your field for six years. You may prune your vineyard and gather its produce for six years. But there will be a Sabbath of complete rest for the land in the seventh year, a Sabbath to Yahweh. You are not to sow your field or prune your vineyard. You are not to reap what grows by itself from, the, from your crop. You are not to reap it or harvest the grapes of your untended vines. It must be a year of complete rest for the land. Leave it there for the animals and for the poor. Okay? Whatever your land produces... Uh, can be food for you, for yourself, your male, your female slave, and hired hand, and foreigner who stays with you. All of its growth may serve as food for your livestock and the wild animals in your land. Again, you know, it just reminds me, there's so many psalms that talk about how God feeds the birds of, of, of the air and the animals and the whales and everything. It says so. I'll, I'll read some later on. It goes on to say another, another environmental rule. Don't harvest the edges and corners of your fields. Leviticus 23:22. Those of you who are farmers, those of you, in fact, I, I am trying to let the corners of my backyard kind of just grow up a, a little wilder, a little thicker, and let the animals, let the rabbits and the squirrels and all that enjoy all that, and let the deer and all that. Uh, we've said for years that the laws of the Old Testament, we call Old Testament, that we no longer have to do or, or, or can do are the laws that pertain to the temple or tabernacle, to the priesthood and sacrifices, because the Messiah fulfilled these once and for all. And we don't have a physical temple and physical priest to do them anyway. But the other laws in Scripture reflect the mind of our God and therefore are good, it says in, in Deuteronomy, therefore are good that it may go well with you. This law of keeping the corners of your fields unharvested 
should be kept today by all of us who are believers. Leviticus 23, 22. When you reap the harvest of your land, you are not to reap all the way to the edge of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Leave them for the poor and the foreign resident. And I will add to that that it's not only helping the poor. When you leave the corners of corn or barley or wheat or whatever is being planted out there, blueberries, anything, that becomes prime habitat for even small animals and birds. And my wife and I spotted a rabbit on the edge of unbuilt land here recently where they had old raspberry and blackberry bushes and other plants. And, and it was fun watching the rabbit just dodge in there. That was its habitat. I keep the back edge of my property, like I said, uh, with the hedges and bird baths, bird feeders here and there. I think Yahweh's pleased with that to help feed the animals that he created. It goes on to repeat that in Leviticus 19, 9 and 10. Uh, don't go back and get every single grape off the vineyard. Don't get every single olive off the olive tree. Leviticus 19, verse 9 and 10. Why? That's for the poor and the foreign residents. And like I said earlier, even for the animals. We are not to strip bare and fully harvest anything we're harvesting. I think that principle would tell us God would be against clear cutting. I think by that principle, we, that becomes very clear. God wants to leave some of it intact, even, even farmland. So um, I know some members of the church who are uh, uh, foresters and they, they believe in clear cutting. I don't think that's biblical. There's even a verse in Deuteronomy 22, verses 6 and 7, which says... I'll read it, Deuteronomy 22, verses 6 and 7. If you come across a bird's nest with chicks or eggs, either in a tree or on the ground along the road, and the mother sitting on the chicks or eggs, you must not take the mother along with the young. You must take the young for yourself. You may take the young for yourself, but be sure to let the mother go free so that you may prosper in the land and live long. I think that makes it very clear that Yahweh... Our great eternal God is concerned for the welfare of even birds. We know that because in Matthew 6, verse 26, Yeshua clearly teaches, Consider the birds of the air. They don't sow, they don't reap, they don't gather into barns, but your heavenly Father feeds them, so why do you worry? Who feeds them? Heavenly Father does. He doesn't even say Jesus does. So his Heavenly Father does. Wouldn't his children also put out bird feeders then? Children are like their father. I recommend it. I love watching the doves, the hummingbirds, the finches, the nuthatch. I love watching even sparrows and grosbeaks, woodpeckers, so many other birds, finches on our property, sometimes just feet away from my window. I smile, I laugh, I take pictures. Father says that, Jesus says that Father in heaven is aware when a simple sparrow falls to the ground. And that can't happen without his permission. Matthew 10, 29. He's aware of every living thing that comes into being and, who, and which dies, I think. There's something in him in all of that, I think. Maybe that last sentence is not necessarily true, but... Somehow he's aware of it. You don't think he knows about all the living things and how we're treating his creation? It's amazing, just amazing. In Psalm 145, verse 16, we see the tenderness of God here. Psalm 145, verse 16, you open your hand and you satisfy the desire of every living thing. Again, I think it's good for us to put out bird baths and bird feeders, and, and nests for, nest for ducks, and so forth. I think it's a good thing we do that, birdhouses and so on. In Psalm 104 and verse 24, the earth is full of your possessions. Psalm 104, verse 27, it talks about the, the various animals, and it says, these all wait for you to give them their food. 
these all wait for you to give them their food. Even the story of Balaam's donkey or Balaam's ass in Numbers 22. When you read the story, you wonder who the ass was. <laughs> I'm sorry, maybe I shouldn't say that. But Numbers 22, verses 26 to 35. God opened the eyes of the donkey to see that the angel of the Lord was standing in the way with a sword. And so the donkey tried to go the other way. And so Balaam struck it with his rod. Numbers 22, verses 26 to 35, you want to read the story. And God opened the mouth of the donkey. And basically after Balaam struck it on the head, the Yahweh opened the mouth of the donkey so it would say, Hey, what was that for? Well, because you kept knocking me against the side of the cliff here, the side of the mountain, I mean. And then it says the angel of the Lord, which probably was the one who became Yeshua, asked or, or made himself visible to both of them. And what's the first thing he said to Balaam? Why did you strike your donkey? Your donkey saved your life, you fool. That's what he says. I don't know if he says you fool, but he said, had, had, had that donkey not turned aside, I would have struck you, Balaam. I would have killed you and spared the donkey. That's why I said which one was the ass. But I think it's interesting that the question it wasn't to Balaam, hey, where are you going? Or something else like that. What are you about to do? The first question was, why did you hit your donkey? We only have so much space in the Bible and space is being given to why did you hit your donkey? I think the point is what I'm trying to say. God isn't pleased when we kick our dog. When we're cruel to animals. When we don't feed them. When we do mean things to any animal. Now, don't say we can't kill them for dinner. We can. But it should be done swiftly, neatly, rapidly in a way that drains all the blood. David was known as a carer of his flocks, a good shepherd. That showed up later on when he became king, most of the time. And this leads us to why this is so important to Yahweh. How we treat the physical is going to be a picture to him of how we're going to deal with the real flocks that we will be given someday. You can read that in Ezekiel 34. <coughs> and when God condemns the current pastors that we have and says that I will provide you good shepherd, a, a good shepherd, David, and, and, uh, and, 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 and I will personally uh, find my flock, he says in Ezekiel 34. Children. Any children hearing this? You're a shepherd of your pet cat or your pet puppy. You're its shepherd. You're its caregiver. I know shepherd talks about sheep, but I'm talking about it figuratively this way. Do you feed your puppy? Do you change the water dish? Do you play with it? Are you gentle with it? Are you training it? Children, parents, all of us, there's n never a time to be mean and cruel to animals. Have I ever been mean and cruel to animals? Yes, I have. I've had to repent of it. I love animals. But all of us lose our temper sometimes. The dog won't come when you call it and on and on and on or the poops in the front room or something when, it's, when you're trying to train it and we can lose our temper. <clears throat> Why did you strike your donkey? Don't, don't forget that. Don't forget that. Men, women, and children of God, I hope the sermon's speaking to your hearts. Now I hope, as I've been speaking about this, and our responsibility that we don't go overboard and worship the earth and its creatures. In fact, God condemns that in Romans 125. So we must see this earth as a gift from our Creator to help us inhabit the earth. The earth was created to be our home, a home we share with other created lives, even as we exert control over it, even as we subdue it, even as we rule over the creation, as Genesis 1 says, but ruling it the way God wants us to rule, as proper stewards, and if we fail to obey the commands to dress and keep the garden we've been given, that's surely sin, for it goes against God's command to dress and keep it. Sin is a transgression of any of God's laws. Now, having said that, I want to try it again to go to the other side on the balance so we don't swing to opposite ditches 
Are we really to endanger human lives and livelihoods and food production to protect the small fish, as they're doing in the northern central California? I think there must be a God-centered answer that addresses all of the needs and get the people together and find a solution. Are we to stop cutting trees altogether, or is that not an overreaction to clear-cutting? Are we to refuse to wear beautiful furs because of animal lovers? I'm all for the fact that the harvesting of fur-bearing animals should be done as humanely as possible. John the Baptist wore a coat of camel's hair. Even God covered Adam and Eve with tunics or skins, as you read the end of Genesis 3. And I certainly believe the global warming argument is way off base, although we know there is coming a time of true global warming when the sun will be markedly hotter and warmer, as you'll read about in Revelation 16, verse 8, where people will be burned by the sun's intense heat. So we must take care of the earth, but we must not go the other ditch either. I want to end by just saying there must be some proactive things you and I can do to start applying the sermon, this teaching, to show that we value God's creation and the environment. Just to get you started, here are a few ideas, and then I want to ask you, what else can you add to these? What other scriptures can you find? There are many, many more. Here's some quick things we can be doing. Obey the scriptures we've been reading. Be kind to the nature around you. Feed the animals. Be gentle and kind to animals. Don't be afraid to eat some. <laughs> you know. But uh, you see what I'm saying. There's a proper balance. Teach the principles to your children. And you teach it mostly by living it. Be an example of all these teachings by the way we act and live and our gentleness to all living things. And your kids will grow up seeing your example. When I say gentleness to all living things, I will kill a slug. I will squash a mosquito. So, <laughs> again, I know there are some people that go the other extreme and they won't kill anything. I will kill a mosquito. I will swat the uh, uh, brown recluse in the house, uh, a spider, you know, a dangerous spider. I love garden spiders, though. So that's the best way to teach it to your children. Uh, I have pictures of me when Rachel was a little girl and our kids were little, um, uh, playing with the, you know, with the garden spiders and all that. <laughs> so anyway, that's the way I am. But, but uh, remember the covenants of God with Noah included all living things. Follow the principles of the land rest every seven years. Now, if you're a farmer, that's going to take some counsel because you might have mortgages to pay and, and bills to pay and everything else. But you see it there in Scripture. Beware and replace dangerous chemical pesticides, fungicides, etc., which can also kill beautiful creatures and, and useful script, uh, uh, creatures like uh, ladybirds, ladybugs, ladybirds they call them in England. Um, use non-chemical biodegradable tools and, and means whenever possible. Uh, we had the, something laying a bunch of uh, foamy white eggs on my flowers. Instead of spraying it, I, I just got some uh, soapy water and uh, washed them off with soapy water, and that seemed to do the trick and protected and didn't kill any uh, ladybugs or praying mantis or anything else that might, might have been out there. Recycle. Reuse whenever possible. Recycle your papers, your newspapers, your plastics and glass. More and more communities are doing that. If yours doesn't, why don't you be a voice in your community to insist that you start a recycling program in your community? Someone started it somewhere. I know in the Northwest and the West Coast it's very, very big, probably most of the United States, but in some places they, they haven't heard of recycling. Recycle your lawn clippings and leaf rakings. You know, make a compost pit. See if you can possibly cut down on the amount of garbage your family generates. Make a goal. One or two less, uh, less kitchen garbage sacks a week. Start a compost pit. Put peelings and eggshells, coffee grounds into the, into the compost. By the way, uh, meat products, dairy products, and citrus peelings, oranges, limes, lemons, they don't do too well in a compost. You'll make it too acidic. Maybe a little bit, but don't put too many of them. And otherwise, everything else... Uh, does well in there. Don't waste water, food, electricity, power. Uh, be a useful steward. Be a good steward of whatever land you control, even if it's a small backyard. Find a way to be kinder to animals. Hopefully God's children 
will never be accused of animal cruelty. Hopefully you will leave the planet cleaner and better when you go camping and hiking. Hopefully you will uh, put out some bird feeders and things like that. And if you're going to kill an animal for food, do it swiftly and cleanly, as humanely as possible. If you're a hunter, improve your accuracy so you're not just maiming animals. When I hunted, if I just winged the duck or something like that and, and, and didn't get it, uh, it, it, I felt terrible. And uh, at least the deer that I shot, I missed a lot of deer, but, uh, but the deer that I shot uh, typically uh, came down pretty quickly. They, they didn't run for miles and miles and get lost. If you're a hunter, improve your accuracy. Sadly, most of our younger generation have been bambified, Bambi, and not realizing that many animals out there are pretty rough on each other, too. They eat each other. <laughs> I know Psalm 96. Let's end with this. <clears throat> I know Psalm 96 is poetry, and you can't take a lot of poetry literally, but try to understand the pathos behind it. And maybe, just maybe, there's some literal meaning to, to these psalms I'm about to read. We read that when Yeshua comes back, when the King of Kings returns, nature itself, the creation is going to explode with joy and cheer and jump up with joy and clap hands, so to speak, when King Yeshua comes with his bride to stop the madness that's going on. Let's read and enjoy the explosion of relief and joy that this planet will experience when King Jesus, King Yeshua, returns. <clears throat> Psalm 96, verses 11 and 12. Let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. Let the sea and all that fills it resound. Let the fields and everything in them exult. Then all the trees of the forest will shout for joy. We're not going to hear the trees shouting for joy, I don't think. But there's something in creation that they will know, finally, finally, someone's here is going to help take care of us. <clears throat> That might sound silly, what I just said to some of you. I really believe they're going to know somehow. Now God's put that in all creation. It says they groan. Psalm 148, verses 7 to 13. Psalm 148, verses 7 to 13. Praise the Lord from the earth, all sea monsters and ocean depths, lightning and hail, snow and cloud. Psalm 148, okay? Powerful wind that executes its command, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all its cedars. Wild animals and all cattle, creatures that crawl and flying birds, kings of the earth and all people, princes and all judges of the earth, young men as well as young women, old men and young together, let them praise the name of Yahweh, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty covers heaven and earth. You're, you're hearing and, and reading in Psalm 148 that all creation is praising Yahweh, where it says the Lord in all big capital letters. In the Hebrew, that's uh, yod heh vod -Heh, which is a tetragrammaton, the, uh, the, the name that means the eternal, the ever-living one. And uh, many people think it's pronounced Yahweh. Some say Jehovah or something like that. But I, I go with Yahweh. In Isaiah 55, verses 12 and 13. Uh, Isaiah 55, verses 12 and 13. Yes, you will go out with joy. You will be led forth in peace. As you come, the mountains and the hills will burst out into song, and all the trees in the countryside will clap their hands. Cypresses will grow in place of thorns. Myrtle trees will grow instead of briars. This will bring fame to Yahweh as an eternal, imperishable sign. Isaiah 55, verses 12 to 13. The earth will mourn no longer. The lands will get their missing land sabbaths and rests. The world will rejuvenate, be restored, and come to life, and finally begin to resemble the Garden of Eden by the time we come to the end of the millennial reign of the King of Kings. You know, plant some trees, plant some flowers, plant some grass. That's what they're doing in Israel. I was there, and I was there 30 or 40 years ago, and uh, about 35 years ago, and it, it's in the 35 years since I last was there. Uh, it is a green, green place, wonderful place. Be a good steward. I'm done over God's creation. If this message has touched your spirit in any way, it would encourage me greatly to hear from you. More importantly, let other people know about it. Pass the word. Let them hear about it, about the message. And I'd love to hear how you're...